Hi everyone! This video will show you how to assemble and adjust your Solex in 30 minutes sharp. Let's go! This is what we have to achieve, that is to say a fully assembled Solex, to observe the sun photosphere in white light, but especially in the line of the hydrogen as on this picture, to see the filaments, the protuberances, the eruptions, etc., etc. To simplify the task, we use a Azor 3D print mechanical kit containing all of the printed parts. You can find the web address of this company on the description of the video. The parts are almost all assembled in the kit, which is very convenient. All the necessary parts are present, including the screws. You don't have to bother with 3D printing if you don't have this kind of material or if you don't know it well. The set includes about a dozen parts pre-assembled with the inserts already mounted. To all these printed elements, it is necessary to, to add a camera, here an uncooled ZWOASI 178 model, efficient for our, our application. It is also necessary to add a focusing system for this camera to achieve the precise focus of the solar spectrum on the detector we use. For example, a helical model ZWO, very practical in our case. Of course, you have the possibility to print all parts. It is not complex and fun. You can find all the files on the Solex site. And this is also one of the interests of the Solex project, do it yourself. But of course, Solex includes optical elements, lenses, a diffraction grating, a slit. This set is delivered by Shell Yak Company. You will also find the address in the description of this video. The kit includes a collimator lens, a camera lens, a 10 micron wide slit and a diffraction grating, here in its box. You must leave the grating in its box as long as possible to avoid burning it. Be careful. This component is very fragile. If you accidentally put your fingers on a lens, you take it on the edges and rub it with cotton, never with eyeglass cleaning paper, which is too abrasive. You can moisten the cotton with water and rub both sides. You can finish with dry cotton. You repeat the operation several times if necessary. You look at the sun that everything goes well, it is very simple. The surfaces are reasonably robust. You can also clean the slit in the same way, but only the side with the large surface, always with cotton to remove fingerprints or dust. On the other hand, the opposite side, visible through the hole, is not accessible, you never touch it, you would do more damage than good. The great secret of optical cleaning is to change the cotton often when you work on a surface which will effectively remove traces of grease. Avoid putting your fingers on the part of the cotton that will be in contact with the glass, always with the idea of not depositing grease, of course. Here's a tricky part, how to get the grating out of its box. It is held by a small blue adhesive tape that we remove. The optical side in front of us is robust, it is not engraved, it can be touched without problem. The fragile optical surface, the grating itself, is on the other side. We turn the box over, we take the grating only by the edge and we put it on the unengraved flat face. You should never, ever touch the optical surface with your fingers. This surface cannot be cleaned at all. If you are not reassured, you can handle the optical parts with gloves, but this is not my case here. Be very careful, always take the grating by the edges and never touch the engraved surface with your fingers, we repeat, even with cotton, even with a brush, even with a feather, only with your eyes. If you put your fingers on it you will kill the grating. You have to buy another one, so be careful. When you don't need it, don't leave it in the air, store it in its box with the engraved side always facing inwards. Know well to recognize the engraved face here of 2400 lines per millimeter. The lines are very fine.
It is the shiny surface that reflects the light a little iridescent. This is the phenomenon of light diffraction. The unengraved surface works like a mirror. You put the grating on this side, obviously not on the engraved side. To carry out the assembly, you do not need many tools. A set of Allen keys. Screwdrivers of various sizes. And finally, a wrench. Everything is there to make the assembly. The first element to assemble is the tube called collimator tube, which we currently have in our fingers. Be careful, there may be small chips, small burrs, because of the 3D printing process. You have to remove them completely with abrasive paper. By rubbing try to remove burrs. Avoid putting dust on the lenses. You can then more easily enter the optical elements. You can rub all parts, even the small slit washer, to remove printing threads for example. The interest, once again, is the ease of assembly and allow the parts to slide well, without hard points. We will now place the lens collimator in the collimator tube. Do not confuse. There are two objective lenses in the Solex optical kit, the collimator lens and the camera lens. Do not confuse these two lenses. The collimator lens is referenced in its bag, OP0176. It is easy to recognize because it is the thicker of the two. You need to mount the thicker one in the collimator tube, the thinner one that will be used later. Keep in mind that the lens we are currently interested is the thicker of the two. On this figure, on the left, the camera lens, on the right, the collimator lens. Also pay attention to the mounting direction of the of the lens. It is not indifferent. The side that will be outside is the more the more curved of the two. The lens is an achromatic doublet, and the thinner element must also be towards the outside of the tube. You must not make a mistake. Otherwise, you will get very degraded images. We repeat. Here is the collimator lens seen in profile. Notice that the radii of curvature are different between the two faces. That the thickness of glass at the edge are also different. And that the lens must be inserted in the collimator tube in the direction indicated by the arrow. We mount the lens in the collimator tube. It must slide easily without effort, in a soft way. We tap it so that it falls on the shoulder where it rests. If there are no burrs, it glides smoothly. Check this point. Be careful that it does not mount crooked. Press lightly with a cotton swab to make sure it rests on the shoulder. Of course do not press with your finger to avoid messing. We will now attach the collimator lens in its tube, with a split ring. Be careful, there are two rings in the kit and it is a trap. One is thicker than the other. Look carefully at the difference. The one to use here is the thicker one. If you mount a thinner one, you will find that there is no gap between the tube and the ring. Moreover, if you shake the tube, you will notice that the lens is free inside. This makes a characteristic noise, which is not normal. This noise indicates that the lens is not held properly. The thin ring should be removed and replaced with the thick ring. We push the ring in well, then we observe that there is a gap between the ring and the tube. And also that there is no more noise when we shake. In this case everything goes well. The collimator lens is correctly integrated in the tube. The thin ring will be used later. Let's move on to the next operation. It consists in mounting the collimator tube in the telescope interface tube. The tube must slide without forcing. 
You then mount two M4 screws in the inserts provided on the interface tube. Note that one of the inserts is not used. It is located in the extension of the two inserts used to fix the slit. This will be the next operation. There is a side where there are no inserts. Respect this arrangement of the screws on the cube. You only tighten the screws by hand to keep the tube in place and not to let it slip. So don't tighten the screws at this time. We will now proceed to the assembly of the slit on its washer, which is here. We use the two M3 screws to hold the slit. The hole being assembled later in the cube of interface telescope. We unscrew the two M3 screws and we mount the slit. But be careful. The slit must be well inserted and it is especially important that it is well on the shoulder. It is possible that a burr or a nil fitting hole diameter will cause a problem. In this case, do not insist. With patience, use sandpaper to enlarge the hole. In the end, the slit should fit without any problems. You tighten the two M3 screws moderately. It is not useful to force. See how the slit washer should be positioned in the telescope interface cube, or collimator cube. Examine the plane of the slit, it is reflective and inclined at an angle of 15 degrees. It is necessary to correctly orient this plane in the collimator cube, as shown. Based on the position of the screws, the free insert, the two mounted screws, the face without inserts of the cube. Mount the slit washer in the inclined plane in the direction indicated. Finally, you tighten moderately with two M4 screws. If you put a trace of fingerprints, do not worry, you rub with cotton as always. And eventually you blow to remove the dust. Good. We now have the slit mounted in the collimator cube, also our telescope interface, and the collimator tube also attached. The collimator tube should slide easily into the telescope interface cube. The work that we will do now is to finally adjust the distance between the lens and the slit. We catch our breath. Beforehand, it is necessary to mount the camera lens in its tube. We recover this tube by unscrewing two screws of the Solex box. Once the tube is extracted, this element will be used as a small telescope. The objective will be at one end and the CMOS camera at the other end. We will make a small refractive telescope. Here is the camera lens that we will now mount. As always, we must pay attention to the orientation. It is a doublet achromatic glued. Locate the thinnest lens of the doublet. It is this thin element that should be on top when mounting the lens in the tube. The camera lens tube must slide smoothly into the tube. The functional mechanical gap observed by shaking is normal. If necessary, push with a cotton swab to check that the lens is resting on its shoulder and that everything is nominal. We tighten with the remaining narrow split ring. We check that there is a small gap between the tube and the ring. We shake to check that nothing moves now. It is perfect. The helical focusing system ZWO is now mounted by screwing. We tighten a little firmly. We also mount the camera. But we do not forget before a small ring provided in the mechanical kit which allows to adjust the back focus. You can of course print yourself this element. We tighten, then we position the camera in the interface 1.25 inch, and we tighten. The whole thing forms a small telescope. With in front a 125 mm focal length lens and in the back, a camera. We are going to observe with that a very distant landscape, almost at infinity, then we are going to adjust the focusing to have its image as clear as possible in the electronic image. 
This is what we will realize now. For this operation, we need the small telescope. We observe a distant scene during the day. It is practical. We also need a small tool to aim, provided in the mechanical kit. It facilitates the operations with a photographic support. We slide the tube in the tooling and we tighten. The camera is connected to the computer. We use here the SharpTap software to acquire and visualize the images, but you have other possible choices, of course. We work in one by one bin and for a maximum of precision. We have to adjust the contrast to detail the image. Finally, we adjust the focus by turning on the helical system. Attention, the camera we use is sensitive from the visible to the infrared, while the lens we use works really well only in the visible. Chromatism is severe in the infrared and ultraviolet. It is therefore recommended to place an infrared and ultraviolet cutoff filter in front of the lens. By removing the IR and UV radiation, the image will be sharper because the focus will be made in a spectral range consistent with our future observations, in the visible spectrum for the most part. This type of filter is not very expensive, we recommend its use. It is important to work only in the central part of the image. Indeed, optical aberrations produce a blur on the edges. So Lex is optically optimized for consistency with a central focus at this stage. This is an important point to remember. The operation is simple. We then act on the focus by moving the camera forward and backward with the helical focusing system. With a little care you will quickly arrive at a good result, that is to say a clear image for a target located at a distance close to infinity. The desired precision is 0.2 to 0.3 millimeters. Once this is done, tighten the screw that locks the adjustment and you do not touch it anymore for the rest of the operations. The next step is to mount the diffraction grating in its support, then the whole assembly will be placed in the Solex box. It is positioned in this way. By a simple rotation, this lever allows to select the observed wavelengths. It is the wheel of the Solex. Optionally, a system with index facilitates the research of the wavelengths. It is associated with a printed marker that you can attach to the case. The files are available on the Solex website. You can position it in the housing provided for this purpose. Here is the wavelength index in place. Here is the Grattan support system. By unscrewing the upper M3 screw, you can remove the small part that holds the grating. You then free the housing in which you will be able to put the grating. Note the presence of a housing in which the grating is placed for a good positioning. As always, you have to be careful when manipulating the grating. It is currently in its box. We will remove it. The upper face here is not fragile, we remind it. The engraved face is underneath. This sensitive face, the one which will diffract the light, is currently protected. It will be positioned in the on this side on the support, to be illuminated. We delicately remove the adhesive tape, without getting angry, in the calm that we put aside. We turn the box over, we release the grating in our hand, we take it by the edges, and we put it on the unengraved side. Look closely. If you look at the edge of the grating, you will see a small oriented arrow. This arrow is used to orientate the grating correctly in the support. This is the correct orientation. Attention, sometimes the arrow is on the opposite edge. Remember that it is the direction of the arrow in relation to the support that counts here. Of course it is necessary that the engraved face is outside and especially not inside. And of course, you never touch with your fingers. Never. Reassemble the upper locking piece. Tighten moderately. Check that the grating is well held and that it is well centered in relation to its support. 
You only have to mount the hole in the housing provided in the select box. You check that the device turns correctly. You finish by mounting the two screws and four that will lock the grating in the desired orientation. Add washers for a good mechanical holding. You remove the collimator tube from the telescope interface cube. You then mount the collimator tube in the Solex box. Normally the tube slides easily. It is very important that the tube is pushed in as far as possible and rests on the shoulder inside the Solex. If the tube does not slide easily, unscrew the screws of the housing slightly. You will tighten them more firmly later. Keep in mind that the collimator tube must rest on the internal shoulder of the Solex housing. You mount this small reinforcement plate, which stiffens the instrument, using the two M4 threaded holes. Once the collimator tube is well inserted, you tighten this screw. No need to force it too much. You will leave an imprint in the plastic with the end of the screw that ensures a good hold. Do the same thing on the other side, with another screw. Make the same tightening. The collimator tube is now well coupled to the Solex box. You don't have to come back to it in principle. Then reassemble the interface cube on the collimator tube. Respect the orientation indicated for the plane of the slit. If the interface does not slide well on the tube, unscrew these screws a little. If the sliding is still not satisfactory, you can increase the separation of the grooves by using a file. This is a classic solution. Remember that you can also use sandpaper. It should go well in the end. You mount this screw loosely. The interface should be able to move easily over a limited range of travel. This allows you to adjust the distance from the slit to the collimator lens. The previously adjusted lens and camera assembly is mounted in the Solex housing. This setting has not been changed. We press well on the internal shoulder, and we tighten the screw with an Allen key. Do not force too much. A second M4 screw secures the hole. The camera is well maintained in place. The focus is fixed. We recommend at this stage to mount the Type T2 interface to the front of the Solex, in this way. You simply screw the 1.25 inch connector. It allows to mount the IR and UV cut filter used before. It is of course possible to remove the 1.25 inch interface. This part also protects the slit from accidental shocks and makes the interface with the telescope. The T2 interface is now fixed. You can reassemble the 1.25 inch connector, probably the same one that equips your camera. We arrive at the last step of the setup. Point Solex during the day towards the sky, even if there are clouds. This is an important moment because you will probably see your first spectrum with Solex on this occasion, if the focus is approximately right. The result is displayed on the computer screen. You can move around the spectrum by turning the wheel of the gating. Remember to slightly loosen the two retaining screws. Choose a region of the spectrum with many spectral lines, well contrasted. Do not hesitate to explore the spectrum. Note that the spectral dispersion is vertical, an important choice for a fast reading of the detector. To adjust the verticality of the dispersion, slightly unscrew the screws holding the 1.25 inch connector, and turn the camera. The focus is not changed if you stay in the interface along the longitudinal axis. The adjustment that we will make concerns the collimator. We do not touch the camera part at this stage. It is possible that at the beginning your spectrum is not well centered along the horizontal axis. In this case, you need to use shims under the select grating handle to tilt the grating so as to bring the image towards the center. 
You can add several layers of adhesive tape to adjust the inclination. Here aluminum tape, very practical. You can play with the strength of the screws for a fine adjustment. You will get into the habit of making this adjustment. Here the position of the right and left edges are well within the limits of the sensor, well centered in the limits of the edges of the slit. We have seen that it is possible to orient the camera so that the axis of dispersion is vertical, parallel to the columns of the detector. But also be careful that the spectral lines are horizontal. Here, there is an optical distortion that bends the lines, but you must consider the average orientation. This horizontality setting is important to achieve high-quality images of the sun. To do this you must orient the slit at the entrance of Solex by unscrewing the M4 screws and turning. We tighten again to make a test to see if the image of the line has become horizontal. But the most important adjustment here is to have the sharpest possible spectrum. For this we act on the collimator cube that we slide on the collimator tube. To facilitate operations we propose to observe the zero order of the spectrum. It is a white image of the slit, not spectrally dispersed. To improve the accuracy, it is a good idea to use an IR and UV cutoff filter in front of the slit. So we turn the control lever of the grating towards order zero and we watch the screen. The image of order zero will appear, an image of the slit without dispersion, where all the colors are gathered. The grating behaves here like a mirror. It is from this image that we realized the ability to make an adjustment of the collimator block. Work with pin in one by one during camera reading and zoom in on the image to see the slit better. Center the slit image vertically by adjusting the vertical display slider and turning the grating wheel. Do the same thing along the horizontal axis. Make the adjustments by examining the central part of the image, the most representative. Be careful not to saturate the image to judge the blur. Adjust the exposure time and the gain of the CMOS camera. You unscrew the screws on the collimator block to release the movement, and then you gently move the collimator block. In this way you change the distance between the slit and the collimator lens. At the same time, watch what happens on the screen. For example, here the image is blurred, but with a little patience and skill you can make it very sharp. This is clearly the only really tricky adjustment of Solex. What can happen when you tighten the screws is an uncontrolled movement of the cube. Initially you have to tighten the screws gently. You can also be led to anticipate the defocusing induced by the tightening of the M4 screws, which complicates the task. A few mistakes allow you to learn. And remember that this adjustment is to be done only once. If you have to make several adjustments, screw marks will appear on the tube. You will work better by turning the tube to find a blank area. Remember at the end to tighten all the screws of the interface block. Also think about this one, which ensures a good rigidity. One takes advantage of having the image in the order zero in the center of the sensor to adjust the index which is on the wheel of the grating, so as to position this index in front of the mark order zero on the printed pattern. To do this, unscrew the two M3 screws here, and turn the index to bring it in front of the zero mark. That's it. It's done. It is now easy to move in the spectrum with knowledge. For example, we go to the green part to see what happens there. One is thus here in the green part. There are many spectral lines. Note that they are very thin. This is a sign of a good setting. But you can go further in the analysis. Look at the image of one of the edges of the slit, the actual physical boundary. This boundary is also very sharp, which is a confirmation of a good setting. Look also at these very vertical, 
called transverse ileum. These are the images of fine dust on this lid. They are also very sharp, which is excellent. Unfortunately, it can happen that the lines are sharp and the edge of the board blurred. This difficulty, quite rare, often comes from a bad setting at infinity of the camera lens. This optical problem, called astigmatism, does not allow you to obtain the same sharpness point depending on whether the lines are vertical or horizontal. To correct this problem, turn the helical ring to focus the camera. Move only two or three tenths of a millimeter, and then resharpen the spectral lines by moving the collimator cube. Now look if the equality of sharpness is improved between the lines and the edges of the slit, if not defocus the camera in the other direction. Here, we are at the level of the H-alpha line of hydrogen. This line, very dark, is clearly visible in the center. It is sharp, but also the left edge of the slit and the right edge like razor blades. We remind you that this astigmatism problem is quite rare, but a good idea is to check that it does not affect your instrument. Think about it when you adjust Solex. This procedure is simpler than it seems in practice. The good news is that you are done with the Solex adjustment. Tighten the screws, and you don't have to come back. Here we observe the red line of hydrogen, the H-alpha line. Note that we use the proprietary software ZWO for the acquisition, but you have many other possibilities, of course. Now we position on the H-beta line in the blue-green part of the spectrum by turning the wheel of the Solex. The wavelength index is very useful for this, because look, the H-beta line is now on the screen. Note that the image is quite sharp. In fact, the focus adjustment made at zero order keeps it in the red, in the green, in the blue. Only minor adjustments will sometimes be necessary with the camera's focusing system. Unfortunately, there is one exception. Take a look. We have targeted the ultraviolet region. And if you look at the screen, you can see that the famous H and K lines of calcium are blurred. They are blurred because the chromatism of Solex is severe in this part of the spectrum. It is then necessary to correct this defect by adjusting the focus with the helical system. This is what we will do now. Look, little by little, we approach the good sharpness of the lines. Finally, the image is very correct in the ultraviolet. This chromaticism is far from being negligible, as we can see. Here we are in the ultraviolet position, and here we pass in the red or the green. There is one millimeter to retouch, but this value is a constant of the instrument, easy to apply when necessary. Of course, by definition, we will use Olex in daylight, in full sun. So, check that the instrument is well sealed against stray light which could enter through accidental openings. Do a test. Close the entrance of the Solex with a cap, then make exposures of 2 or 3 seconds to check that no significant signal arrives on the detector. This ensures that your images of the sun will be in perfect contrast. It happens that in the Solex rear area has a weakness on this point. If you notice this, Place an aluminum type tape. Okay, it's unsightly, but it's also very effective and you'll be able to work with peace of mind if the need arises. Well, your Solex is set. Everything was adjusted on the table in a short time. It is ready for service, ready to be mounted on a telescope to make great observations of the sun. Now, it's your turn to play.